tour that will take him next week by the weekend to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey, where he will be talking to them about ways, in quotation, to ease you out. In London and Berlin this week, earlier this week, he said that President Assad must go. And he also said that one of his first moves is to draft diplomatic proposals to persuade you to give up power. Would you invite him to Damascus for talks? What would you say to him? What is your message to him now, given what he said this week and what he plans to say to his allies when he visits them over the weekend? And if possible, from your knowledge of him, how do you describe um, how would you describe Kerry from your knowledge of him in the past? I'd rather describe uh, policies rather than describing uh, people. So uh, it's still early to uh, judge him. It's, it's only a few weeks since he became uh, a minister. Uh, first of all, the point that you've mentioned related to internal Syrian uh, matter, Syrian issues. Uh, any Syrian subject wouldn't be raised with any foreigners. We only, uh, we only discuss it with Syrian within Syria. So we're not, we're not going to discuss with anyone who's coming from abroad internal matters. We have friends. We discuss our issues with the friends. We listen to their advice, but at the end, it's our decision as Syrian to make what's good for our country. Uh, uh, but uh, if anyone wants to genuinely, and under two quotation I stress the word genuinely, help Syria and help the cessation of violence in our country, he can do only one thing. He can go to Turkey and sit with Erdogan and tell him, stop smuggling terrorists into Syria. Stop sending armaments. Stop providing logistical support to those terrorists. He can go to Qatar and Saudi Arabia and tell them stop financing the terrorists in Syria. This is the only thing that anyone can do dealing with the external part of our problem. But no one from outside Syria can deal with the internal part of this problem. So what is your message to Kerry? Very clear. To understand what I said now. If, I mean, if you want me to not message to Kerry, to anyone who's, who's talking about the Syrian issue, only Syrian people can tell the president, stay or leave, come or go. No one else. Just, uh, I'm just saying this clearly in order not to waste the time of others to know where to focus. What role, if any, do you see for Britain in any peace process for Syria? Hmm. Have there been any informal contacts with the British? And what is your reaction to Cameron, Prime Minister Cameron's support for the opposition? What would you say if you were sitting with him now, especially that Britain is calling for arming the rebels? Hmm. There's no contact between Syria and Britain for a long time. Uh, if you want to talk about the role, you cannot separate the role from the credibility. And we cannot separate the credibility from the history of that country. And to be frank, now I'm talking to a British journalist, to a British audience, to be frank. Uh, Britain has played uh, famously, famously in our region, unconstructive role in different issues for, for decades, some say for centuries. I'm telling you now the perception in, uh, in our region. And the problem with this government that they are shallow and uh, immature rhetorics only highlight this tradition of uh, bullying and hegemony. I'm being frank with you. Uh, how can we expect to ask Britain to play a role while uh, it's uh, determined to militarize the problem? How can you ask them to play a role in, in making the situation better, more stable? How can we expect them to make the violence less uh, while they s want to send military uh, supply to the terrorists and don't try to ease the dialogue between the Syrians. This is uh, not uh, logical. I think they are working against that and they are working against the interests of the UK uh, itself. 
this government is acting in a naive, confused, and unrealistic manner. If they want to play a role, they have to change this. They have to act in more reasonable and responsible uh, way. Till then, we don't expect from arsonist to be a firefighter. Thank you, Mr. President. تطور الميداني الأبرز وربما يكون الأهم هو ما حققه الجيش السوري في على الطريق الدولية بين حماه وحلب القيادة العامة للجيش والقوات المسلحة السورية أعلنت منذ قليل في بيان صادر عنها أن الجيش السوري طهر عدة قرى من بلدا بدءا من بلدة السلامية وصولا إلى السلامية في حماة وصولا إلى مطار حلب الدولي حسب ما يعني أفدنا من مصدر عسكري فإن أكثر من عشرين بلدة على هذه الطريق الدولية استطاع الجيش إحكام سيطرته أو استعادة سيطرته عليها وحسب المصدر العسكري فإن هذا هذه العملية ستتيح للجيش السوري يعني تحقيق أرياحية أفضل على مستوى العمليات العسكرية في حلب تحديدا ويمكن أن تنتقل هذه العمليات إثر التعزيزات التي يمكن أن تصل عبر هذا الطريق إلى مناطق أقصى الشمال أي في ريف حلب الشمالي طبعا أيضا المصر العسكري أفاد بأن هذا سيطرة الجيش على تلك البلدات وصولا إلى بلدة النيرب ومطار دمشق الدولي سيعني أن ذلك قضى على أمال المسلحين في الوصول إلى مطار حلب الدولي أو محاولة الوصول أو السيطرة على مطار النيرب هذا بالنسبة لحلب خالد طبعا الاشتباكات تستمر متقطعة وأحيانا تكون عنيفة بين عشرات أو مئات المسلحين الذين يهاجمون منذ عدة ساعات عدة محاور في مدينة الرقة والاشتباكات مستمرة بين المسلحين وقوات الجيش السوري أيضا المعلومات تفيد بأن هذا الهجوم أو أو ميليشيات المعارضة المسلحة حتى الآن فشلت في تحقيق اختراق نوعي في مدينة الرقة بعد عمليات أو اشتباكات عنيفة مع قوات الجيش السوري هي حرب الشوارع أنفاق أدراج ممرات بتاريس منافذ بكافة الأشكال سمات تميز هذا النوع من المعارك حي وادي السايح يعد المدخل لحي الخالدية الشهير مع غيره من الأحياء في حمص يشهد مواجهات عنيفة منذ أشهر بين الجيش السوري والمجموعات المسلحة التي اتخذت من أبنية المدنيين مقارا وساحات للمعارك ما جعل الجيش السوري يتقدم خطوة تلو الخطوة ليواجه المجموعات المسلحة على بعد صدى أصواتهم ليس إلا سنتمنى نتقدم حتى نقلص سوريا من رجس الاصابات الارهابيه المسلحه الانفاق التي حفرتها المجموعات المسلحه باتت الطرق الرئيسيه لهم للتنقل ونقل السلاح والعتاد التنقل بين أحياء حمص وخصوصا الوصول إلى الأحياء الساخنة يحتاج إلى الدخول في دهاليز وفي أنفاق وهذا النفق هو أحد الأنفاق الذي اكتشفه الجيش العربي السوري وكان بيد المجموعات المسلحة وكانت تستخدم المجموعات المسلحة للتنقل بين الأحياء ولنقل الأسلحة والعتاد قد يكون النفق أحيانا مقتلا للمجموعات المسلحة إذا اكتشفتها قوات الجيش السوري هل بتبقوا وسيلة حفر النفق وإنه ما عندهم مجال تاني إنه ما عندهم قدرة يواجهوا أبطال الجيش فبتبقوا حفر الأنفاق تحت الأرض واحد ليهربوا منها اثنين ليحاولوا يتسللوا عناصر الجيش بس الحمد لله رب العالمين كل عناصر الجيش يغزين وصاحبين
وحدات الجيش فككت عبوات ناسفة مزروعة وتمركزت في كتل جديدة في الحي الذي تتلاصق أبنيته بعضها ببعض ومع أبنية الأحياء الأخرى وتبقى بعض الفوهات الصغيرة مرصدا لتحركات المسلحين جدران الأبنية تدل بوضوح على شراسة في القتال وعلى صعوبة التقدم نحو الأمام لكن وحدات الجيش تتابع عملياتها لإعادة الأمن لباقي أجزاء المدينة Diane has been reporting from the region this week, and we are very happy to have her join us today. On this show, we open the floor to you. And the first question, Diane, comes from Bob from Colorado Springs, who writes, Your piece on Syria was brilliant. The interview with Bashar al-Assad was top-notch, he said. But his question, did he ask you any questions? And if so, what were they and what were your answers? He did ask me questions, quite a few questions about American politics, a little bit about American culture. But I have to tell you, he is so informed. I mean, he was talking about Barack Obama's poll numbers. He was following the relative races. So he is following with extreme care what's happening in the United States. But he wanted to know some of the interactions between the media and the candidates and how things worked. He did. Wow. Well, see, he's definitely an educated man. All right, let's hear from a guy named Rad. He writes from New Hampshire. He emailed us this question. Did you feel in Damascus that Syrian people are terrorist or tolerant, Rad writes? Did you feel coexistence between different sects or radicalism? Well, you know, on a religious level here in Syria, it is a, a phenomenon of this country to have this much religious interaction and tolerance. You have the same areas, a mosque, a shrine, a temple, uh, and in, in all of it, all faiths are praying. So it's a remarkable feature of Syria and has been for hundreds of years. Uh, at the same time, as you know, this is a complicated region, and what defines a terrorist here is different from what defines a terrorist in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it is a balancing act to live this closely to Iran on the one side, to the Saudis, sometimes on a completely different part of the spectrum, to the United States on a different part of the spectrum. But in personal terms, when you wander the streets, when you talk to people, there is extreme friendliness. Mm. There is only excitement at getting to see you and talk to you. Mm. All right, all the way from Honolulu, Hawaii, Heather sent this question to you, Diane. Do young adults in Syria want to come to America to see what it's like? She says she's always wanted to go to Syria. Yes, I think they do. And not only that, they, you know, they can see a lot of American television here. Uh, a number of people have talked about ER, Friends. They're watching American television here. So you wander the street and you do get people saying, do you know George Clooney? What is George <laughs> Clooney like? This is a very secular culture in that way. Did they know who you were, Diane? Had they heard of you? <laughs> Some of them had because there is a satellite channel that carries Good Morning America oh, wow. here. So yes, indeed, in, in a small way. <laughs> Okay, now let's hear from Sean from North Carolina. He wanted to know, what is the general opinion of the average American in Syria? What do they think of us? You know, I think that they really do make a firm distinction between American government policies and the American people, and there is a connection to the American people. And there is a sense that America is full of vitality and the kind of vitality that in this secular culture would be so welcome and if if relations could begin in such a way that they could fuel each other it would be to the benefit of everyone and we have a conversation coming up which I hope you'll post some of here as well in which we talk with a group of Syrian women about everything about dating about sex and the city the city being Damascus in this case <laughs> and also about the common aspirations of, of people all over the world. Well, that leads very well into our, the next question here from Sabrina from St. Louis, Missouri. She sent in this. She asked, why is it that women have to cover their hair in the temple and men are not required to? Basically, what is offensive about women's hair, Sabrina asks. Well, in this part of the world, female hair is considered very seductive and you cover your hair as a sign of chastity that you are not trying to interest a man, particularly in the, in the mosque. 
and certainly not any man who is not your husband. And we, you know, we had a group of the teenagers, of the young people, they were in their 20s actually, talking to us before, and they said it's a double standard. It's a double standard. Mm. We know that here. Uh, but that there are other things about our traditions and our family and our religion that are so reinforcing that we accept that. Very interesting. All right, our final question for you, Diane. Maria from Santa Fe, New Mexico, who writes, is it safe for Americans to travel in Damascus? And also she asks, will you show more of your trip on ABC's prime time? She says that would be great. Well, thank her for that. I'll talk to the producers when I get back <laughs> about prime time. Uh, but, you know, we have to respect the fact that in this region, generally, there is so much more volatility. And not long ago, there was a foiled terrorist uh, attempt, a plan at least, on the American embassy here. The Syrian government helped foil it. So there is certainly some increased concern about this part of the world. But did I feel in any way insecure or unsafe? No. Did the team here? Absolutely not. And we did see American tourists here and tourists from all over Europe here. So I, I would just encourage everyone to keep a sense of proportion. Well, Diane, I hear Damascus is a beautiful place. I certainly hope you have some time to see the sights. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on our show. Diane Sawyer in Damascus, Syria. Thank you so much. Bye. Brief you on the High Commissioner's remarks briefed the council today again. He stated unequivocally that we might be reaching a moment of reckoning in the region as far as the external dimension is concerned, uh, especially with regard to your earlier question uh, over the historical evolution over the last uh, two years now. Um, I think it is useful to recall that in April 2012, UNHCR had a total of 33,000 Syrian refugees on our books in the region. As of yesterday, we had registered or given out registration documents to some 336,000 refugees, or nearly a 30 times increase over the period of 10 months ago. In fact, since early January, some 40,000 Syrians have fled every week into the neighboring countries. Uh, roughly speaking, without going into the details, we, we could be talking now about uh, 400,000 refugees in both Lebanon and in Jordan. Uh, we are approaching 300,000 in Turkey and over 100,000 have already made their way to Iraq and there are thousands of others who have made their way further beyond into Europe and North Africa. One particular point that the High Commissioner was also quick to underline is that we should not forget in this equation the situation of Palestinians who have been hosted by Syria for many years, as you know, and of whom more than 30,000 have made their way now into neighboring Lebanon. And so it is vital that UNRWA receives the essential support to stabilize the situation, not only among the population within Syria, but also 